It's going to be going to be fabulous to see somebody run for office while they're uh, testifying. Yeah, yeah, it's just going. You know what? It's going to be a shit show. And but you know, the funny thing is, you can say no to a, a select committee and see how far you get. You can't say no to the Justice Department today. The, the only takeaway from the uh, charges that are pending against Donald Trump for all the awful things he's done Department. in the Today, America. the only takeaway is, from is the that this case sending against Donald Trump for all is the largest ever by the United States uh, Justice Department. Now, they've run some big cases and they've run some secret cases and they've run some tiny cases and they've run some horrible cases. But uh, this one, before it even were through all the paperwork, is the largest in the history of the U.S. Justice Department. That tells me finally someone is taking this this corrupt, odious, dark, terrible man seriously enough to know that if we don't stop him, there'll be no end to it. In fact, that's the rule, Vinny. You, have you ever played ball with a guy who's, who tells you right up front, I'm never going to stop? I'm never well, going to stop. Well, yeah, then, then you have to, uh, you know, then you have to, to beat him down. Then, then you have to do things that you don't like to do. Um, I, I rest my case. Vinny's by the way, it, it, we are live on air uh, on uh, Facebook. I know we're a little late this morning. Uh, actually, we are one hour late because I was uh, engulfed in the Bruce Springsteen frenzy. What are you going to do? <laughs> which I won't, uh, I won't do again. I mean, I, you know, I wasted an hour of my life trying to get Bruce Springsteen tickets and did not get them. And uh, to be honest with you... Um, Halfway through the process, I was saying, what, what, what kind of asshole am I uh, that I'm sitting here trying to buy tickets uh, that the cheapest ones that I can come up with are, uh, you know, $5,000 for the, for, the, for the pair. For the privilege. For the privilege of going to see uh, Bruce Springsteen and Steve Van Zant and uh, his E Street Band. Um, is is um the guitarist from uh grin um nils lofgren is he, is he in the band yeah he's in the band good um i think he's a great guitarist i think he's yeah a great oh, no. uh, there's, there's no losers in the band as far as musicians this is not about their musicianship this is just about their management and how so many people are uh the, the system that they have to buy tickets is ridiculous it's, it's awful it's the worst it's, possible it's way to treat fans every scalper in the united states must have a pair of tickets to sell uh but yet fans true fans people who were there in 1975 uh and when you know you, you, you stood outside the bottom line to try to get in um that's my question when's the first show you saw with springsteen bottom line in 75 i think it was and the bottom line held what 500 yeah five well a little bit more than that probably five six hundred yeah but um that was uh that, that was the first time although i'm still pretty convinced that i saw him on the jersey shore when i used to go down there I, and i don't know if it was him if it was steel mill or what you know but i'm pretty i mean i spent enough time in some of those places down there that i had a you know yet there's only a limited amount of bands to play down here. So, uh, but the first time that it was Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band was uh, 75 at the bottom line. By the way, where is E Street? E Street is uh, in Asbury Park. It's a known thoroughfare. I would find E Street easily if I were in Asbury Park this morning. Yeah, yeah, you'd, you'd find that. Um, you know, I, I mean, just, just all of the. Um, it, it, it leaves you with the, it's like an unrequited love affair. Yeah. You, you know, I mean, you feel like you have been loyal to Bruce Springsteen. You've seen him in a, in a, in a number of places. You've traveled all over the place. You've driven all night to see him. Uh, the words of his music have paralleled the events in your life. Uh, he seems to have a good handle on what 
the average person is thinking and is feeling. And he must and know. It, he must know, know how you feel. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I, I hope he does. I don't think he does. I mean, I think he's been out of touch for a while with what's going on uh, out here. And I say that. I think we talked about this the other day uh, when he. Um, when Hillary Clinton was in the battle, when this country was in the battle of its soul in 2016, did he go on the road? Did he go out there and do a bunch of concerts? Did he talk to, no, he did like one show. Was the, like when Barack Obama was running, he was out there uh, all over the place. And when's the last time you saw Bruce? The last, and, and this is why I guess I'm not as upset as I should be. The last time I saw Bruce Springsteen, uh, a friend of mine, somebody who I know for, she, matter of fact, she is the daughter of the owner of the record store that I used to work in when I was like in head shop, uh, when I was, I don't know, 13, 14 years old. Uh, pick up a bong and a new lighter when you go by there, would you please? And uh, and we and, and, and we went, she, um, she was in New York, and I drove from Pittsburgh to New York, and then we went down to Asbury Park Woo. on the opening, uh, the second night. The first, he opened the, show, uh, the, 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 the Disciples of Soul show, opened in Los Angeles, and Bruce showed up there. Wow. And so we didn't go to Los Angeles, but we went to Asbury Park, figuring if there's any place that Bruce is going to show up, It'll be Asbury Park, the, uh, the, the little theater there. So it's, I don't know, like a 500-seat theater or something like that. Not nah, more than that, maybe maybe a, a 2,000 or something like that. Anyway, so we went to the show, and at the and we had great seats, about four rows back. And um, lo and behold, the last set of the show, the, the last few minutes of the show, Bruce came out, did uh, did Sun City, which he hadn't done in, you know, which was the song about apartheid in South Africa and how the artist wouldn't go down there and play anymore. I played and that song at KTIAM in San Rafael when it came out. I still have my 12-inch uh, of that song. And, um, and Bruce came out, did a few numbers, um, and uh, that was it. And so I was happy as a clam. <laughs> I got to see Bruce Springsteen in uh, Asbury Park. I mean, what? it's like going to the Vatican and the Pope comes out to go to McDonald's or something. You know, it's, it's, there, it's the Pope on his way to get a double-double. Yeah, I mean, he's, you know, I mean, that's, that's kind of the equivalent of it. And... It was just uh, it was a great it was a great show. It was uh, a great to see him that up close and in that setting because they're always relaxed in those settings. Same thing when he was in Pittsburgh, and I saw. Oh, you know, it's it's just a different Springsteen. He's not running the show. Somebody else is running the show. He's just there to play some guitar and sing. And um, so it's. So if that's the last time I see him, you know, you can't squeak too much. I, that's it. Uh, but, you, but but you know what? It's his fans that he has cultivated from the very beginning so carefully, and so in some cases you could say it was effortless. He connected with his people, and he had great music, so naturally they loved him. And I don't see how he could get out of touch with that. You can't go too far in Jersey before someone says, "Hey." Calm down, Jersey boy. Calm down over there. Yeah, still I, and, just Bruce Springsteen. And, and I don't. And the reason I really don't understand it is because you know Pearl Jam does not use Ticketmaster. Pearl Will Jam not. uses um, a different system, and they don't buy into um, Ticketmaster's crap. And now we know why. And I mean, I'm sitting there on the on the, the screen here, Michael, and I'm. Clicking on tickets to the two hundred and thirty dollars, and when I check out for the tickets, uh, it's two tickets for thirty five hundred dollars. Nope. 
The tickets went from 200 something to 3500 in the time it took me to click and uh, and go to another screen. Welcome to America. Y'all are going to love it over here. And you're right, as long as people will pay it, they'll, um, they'll get, you know, they'll get it. I mean, I'll keep doing it. But you know, if, if I were selling washing machines and the, and the uh, price tag on the washing machine that I just sold you is 230 bucks, and we come to your house and deliver it, and I say, that's 35.75 plus the delivery charges, what happened? Uh, we changed the price. Didn't anybody tell you? No, we always change the price. How much did you think you were paying? 230. Oh, we don't have any washing machines for 230. These are $3,000 washing machines. And you bought two of them. Well, Mikey, the same thing is happening with cars. I mean, it's, it's it, you know, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's easy to fault Bruce Springsteen because he is this kind of icon of our generation uh, and, and, has felt what we have felt for so long in so many different areas in, in in just in different things that have gone on in our lives but the same thing is going on with cars i mean if you want a car uh you know you have to go in and right now you have to pay and i'm looking for a car for my friend and um he wants uh, an electric car he wants a, you know something that's probably pretty popular and try finding one for under five thousand dollars over manufacturer's suggested retail price. And how did and they arrive at the, how did they arrive at that booster figure? How did they come to that five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars? They just it call it a dealer pack or a a, a market adjustment or a, you know. I like that last kind one. Of, some, yeah, they they come up with some kind of uh, interesting phrase for it. I think uh, that should be the name of our show. To say, well, if you want the car, you got to pay five thousand dollars over. Yeah, just just say it. We're, we're we're digging you for five grand, and maybe seven, depending on the day. Yeah, I, I, mean, I like I like the fact that it's a market adjustment. I think that should be the name of a feature on our show. Good morning, Vinny's here. Vinny, tell us about today's market adjustment. Yeah, well, today's market adjustment, Michael, is that I uh, tried to buy a. Uh, a Ford Mustang II, uh, I mean a, a Mustang uh, Mach E, and uh, the dealer wanted uh, seven thousand dollars as a market adjustment. So Whoa. I adjusted my scrotum and left. <laughs> I pointed it toward the door and followed my scrotum out of the place. Followed my scrotum right out of the place. But here's the thing: they know we're addicted. They know. I, I mean, we are a society that thinks doesn't think with our logic doesn't think doesn't use uh, we want it and we want it now and when we want it now and we have the money who cares so enough people want cars right now want electric cars that the dealers know that they can get away with this with people the people will pay the money to get the car and the only thing that people are doing is screwing themselves because and the deal is really a screwing themselves too you'll never forget you'll never forget a deal like that well not just that but the car companies are looking at this and they're saying here's a golden opportunity for us let these people go out there and let them charge over msrp let them make it horrible i mean it's a horrible experience to go to a car dealer already we all know that it's it's awful you it takes all day but to now to make it even worse because when you previously when you went to a car dealer and you negotiated and you went in there and blah, 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 you walked out and you felt like you walked out with a car and you walked out thinking maybe you got a deal right oh i got this a thousand dollars under MSRP or whatever it was. I, I, you know, meanwhile, the dealer knows that he, you know, still made X amount of dollars on the car. And this I, like, I like it when the, I like it when the dealer says, and we're not taking your trade in. Yeah, you are. No, we don't really want it. Yeah, you do. And it's going to cost you a thousand dollars. Wait a minute. But when now when we go to a dealer and you get that, uh, you know, 10,000 over MSRP or whatever it is, 
you don't walk out of the dealer with that satisfied feeling anymore. You walk out of the dealer feeling like you've been ripped off. And indeed you have. Uh, you walk out of the dealer feeling like you were taken advantage of because you wanted a popular car. And the car companies are making note of this. The FTC is making note of this. Listen, for a long time the car companies have wanted to move from the car dealer model to a direct sales model. Like Amazon. You go on Amazon, you order your car, and it shows up at your house in a couple of days. With they, a market adjustment? Uh, well, well, no, no, because you, it's coming directly from the factory. Cut out the dealer. Right. Pay one price. This car is uh, 27500 if you want it. Here are the options. If you want them, check it off. What color you want? Okay, boom. No negotiation. You do it right on your computer. And, you're, and the car comes to your house. Um, that model is working in the used car business. And it, so far, it has worked with Tesla. Where yeah, go in, this is the price, that's it, that's all. I saw so many Teslas yesterday driving uh, out to Woodland Hills. My God. we must well, have seen it's the most popular car in America. It is all over L.A. They can't make enough of them. And I think part of it is, yeah, it's trendy to be in one, but also you go and it's not, there's no hassle when you go to a Tesla dealer. There's no... No problem. This is the car. This is what it costs. If you want it, sign here, and we'll get it out to you in however many weeks. So they've taken the haggle right out of the deal. There's no haggle. Right. There's no haggle. There's no hassle. There's no Tesla dealer down the corner that will sell it to them for less. You can't walk in with a Tesla ad from a dealer in Ohio to a dealer in Pennsylvania and say, but look what they're selling them for in Ohio. Well, yeah. wait, let me go talk to my sales manager. There, there's none of that. None of that. It's pay the price, uh, buy the options that you want, and wait for your car. And boom. And the car will be the, we'll call you when it's in. When it's in, you come and get it. And and that's it. Built specifically for you. Audit online. No salesman, no nothing. And my non-scientific survey of Teslas yesterday, which came to about 15 different cars, is that they were all black or white. Yeah, there's very few uh, color variations. You know, there's a, there's a maroon, there's a blue... Uh, there's a black and there's a white, and I think there might be one other color in there, but you won't see a, uh, an orange. I think a red, maybe a red. Yeah, well, the maroon is the, is, is the red. Um, you you won't see an orange Tesla rolling down the street unless the owner paint, you know, has it repainted orange. Earl Scheib. Right, right. twenty nine ninety five. you go in and you get a paint. Double uh, A, pop, pop, MCO. Um, so, I mean, that's... That's the deal uh, with with this, if, 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 and the car companies are taking notice of this, and the car companies are saying slowly but surely, because of course there's federal legislation in place that says that a car company can't sell it to you direct, but um, in many cases, just like Uber, Tesla said, "Well, screw the regulations. We We're just going to do it." Why can't I sell my cars direct or any other, any other way I want to sell them? Right. Why can't I do this? What's wrong with me doing this? So that's the, uh, that's the, and, and so what they're going to do, Michael, is they're going to force the dealers um, into no longer selling cars and just being a service facility for cars. Have you noticed that America is in the position right now, if you want to buy gas, the price is high because we, we just can't get gas. You want to buy a car, you got to wait, you got to pay full freight, you got to pay market adjustment, and then you still have to wait for a car. You want groceries, you got to wait. You want This is a country that right now says, hey, we're out of everything, come on in. What do you want? Well, I want a lot of things. Well, we're out of all of them, but we can make a market adjustment to get them to you. Free delivery, but no haggling. We're ready to we're ready to take care of your needs 
on a very slow and predictable and inconvenient basis for you, the customer. But for us, the salespeople, hey, we don't even have product and we're feeling great about our chances because we're taking care of uh, that market adjustment so carefully, so very Americanized. And what, what do you want to buy today? From potato chips to a Cadillac, how are you going to get it? Well, maybe we have them, maybe we don't. And if we don't, we can't even tell you when they're coming in. This is a country where stuff is not available right now. And that's, that's another good reason the prices are high. And the Fed's going to make another adjustment, another reality adjustment, a market adjustment. That's who we are right now, Vinny. It's kind of weird. It's very strange. The pandemic brought it about, and we can't shake it. Yeah, it. I, and, and I'm. I don't know if it's like that in other countries. I don't know if other countries that have um, recovered from the pandemic or have you know come to some state of recovery from the pandemic are having these same problems too. Is England having the same problem? Is uh, Germany having the same problem? Countries that you would consider to be somewhat similar to the United States. Um, and I don't know. I, I mean, listen, I think it's profiteering. Yes. I, 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 there's no doubt in my mind that the oil companies have said, listen, we're not, you know, 10 years down the road, we're not going to be selling as much gasoline as we sold over the past 10 years because electric cars are all over the place. Look at the road, there's Tesla's all over the place and they don't need our gas station. No, they don't. And so we better figure out a way to recover some major profits now because this well literally is gonna dry up and you're not gonna have the, uh, you know, the business. Now, to their credit, some companies are saying, okay, what this switch means that we're going to switch our gas stations or at least put chargers in them so you can pull into a shell station. And if you're not, you know, getting gas, you go over to this side and there'll be electric chargers there and you can sit there and charge your car, go inside, there'll be a lounge, get a cup of coffee, sit and talk to, you know, talk to people while your car's charging. You'll have that, uh, that option. But the oil companies say we got to sock it in now. Yeah, forget about the future. We'll sell that land, and we won't. We just won't have a service station. And there's no more. There's, there's, you know, they're they're not going to start researching for more oil wells if the ones that we have are already going to fill the need. If right. the consumption of fuel is going to go down, or the consumption of electricity is going up. These companies are going to have to become energy companies and right now many the, the consumption of gasoline can only go in one direction and that's down well it hasn't though so far i mean i think we're uh, consuming as much if not more gasoline than we did prior to the pandemic and that's why you know because people listen Americans are, uh, we, we went out and did what Americans do. When there was $2 a gallon gasoline, we, we bought hammers. Or trucks that would suck it down uh, <laughs> pretty quickly. And they said, well, gee, if you know, they'll, 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 if they'll buy it at two, let's see what happens if we take it to three. The thing is, we have two engines in the Dodge Ram. One works and one just burns gas and doesn't do anything for the car. It's, the par it's a parallel market adjustment engine. <laughs> yes, it's a market adjustment. Everything now is a market adjustment. So, I mean, again, inflation is what it is. I know there's a certain amount of inflation, but I just, um, I think it's much more profiteering. And let's face it, the Justice Department right now uh -huh. is, is not worried about profiteering. Their, their direction seems to be uh, to uh, go after a number of people who uh, caused an insurrection in this country on January 6th, a couple of years ago. That seems they're, to be the focus now. They're launching the largest investigation in their history. And it's, it's only pointing at one place, and that's Mar-a-Lago. And don't forget Mark Meadows, who's going to do some time, too, for being such an idiot. Uh, see, I don't think I don't think Mark Meadows is going to do any time. I think Mark Meadows is the guy that's supplying him with a lot of information. 
I think I think Mark Meadows made a deal for himself. I hope so. I don't, I don't think it's public yet, but how do they know who exactly to bring in there and talk to? I mean, how do they know to get his assistant in there? I mean, I, I may be wrong. It's just a theory I have. It's not anything I somebody said to me or nothing. And listen, I'm not. I'm, I'm a. I'm a, a a wine, women, and song guy, so I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not uh, the greatest observer of of politics, but I think I have enough on the ball to smell a rat. Well, you know what we haven't had yet in this side sh show that we've called politics. We haven't had anybody being offered and granted and using immunity. No one is immune yet. Nobody we know. Yeah. Been offered or That's granted. Right. I mean, you know, the the the, con the conception or the the thought is, well, once they do it, they're going to just announce it. Well, no, they're not. They're not going to announce what they're doing. Merrick Garland isn't going to go on TV and say, well, we're doing this and we've offered this. And I don't care if you're CNN or your MSNBC or your Fox News, whoever the hell you are, you're not going to signal what you're doing. It's a, it's it's amazing to me that he even spent time talking to uh, to uh, Lester Holt yesterday. Right. It was amazing that he said that much. I think he said more than he should have. He it, it was a, it was an interesting interview, and uh, I, I think I think it's coming. The, the, the guts ducks are coming home to roost. No one's got immunity. That's right. It could have been awarded to someone quietly. I don't know what the rule is on that. Do you have to announce that you've given immunity? But no, you, I don't think you, you do. Can't John, you can't get John Dottie unless you have a capo. And so I, I think you have to. If you have to tell, I don't. I don't know this to be true, but my thought is that you would have to tell the uh, other people's lawyer, the defendant's lawyer, in discovery. Uh, that you have somebody that has given them direction. I don't know if you have to tell who, because remember, um, I don't think did Gotti know that Sammy the Bull was going to take the st uh, take the stand before he took it. I don't know. Um, I remember it in in. Well, I mean, I'm around long enough to. Uh, well, I don't know. I wasn't there for it. It was a little before my time. But the you uh, were there when Paul Castellano went down in front of the steakhouse. You were well, there. Yeah, though. but 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 the when they gave um, um, Kid Twist Abrels his immunity from testifying against uh, um, Lucky Luciano and Murder Incorporated, Frank Costello, I, I mean, and and Murder Incorporated, um, they didn't inform. Uh, his uh, the lawyers that they did it, but word got to them because somebody, <laughs> you know, uh, tipped them off, and Abe jumped out a window and landed two hundred feet from where you would have. He, in other words, his trajectory was as if he was thrown out a window, not if he had jumped out a window. No, there was a lot of wind that night, Vinny. It was a windblown high fly. Moved old old Abrels right down the block, man. He landed a half a block away from uh, the hotel that he was that they had him staying in. We don't care how far you go out; we're only interested that you go down. So best of luck out there. Yeah, have fun. Uh, it, it, you know what? It's it's a nice ride until that sudden stop when you get to the bottom. Take the local, but if you're on the express, good luck to you. Yeah, it's um, so. I, I don't know if they have to tell them. I would think that they don't, except maybe they have to tell their lawyers or something like that, that they have somebody. I don't know if they have to name them. Um, and then you go from there. You know, if I were Trump, oh, God, I'm sorry I said that. <laughs> I really, God, please, please. Like that Twilight Zone where the guy... Uh, wants all the power in the world, he winds up as Hitler. <laughs> um, I, I, Enjoy your stay. Yeah, if, if I'm Trump, man, I'm packing the stuff, getting on a boat, going to Bimini. And you know what? If he went away and disappeared and never came back, it would it would be it would be just fine. 
too bad he can't do that. You know, in his heart, he thinks he's going to run and win again, and take over the nation and run it forever. Well, I'm starting to think he's the only one that does. Yes. Don't be surprised if that, in fact, is the case. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I think he's so out of touch yeah. with reality. I mean, I think he's, I think he's got a, a serious mental problem. I mean, I think oh, yes. oh, you yes. know, syphilis or whatever's gotten to is is nut. Yep. And, and I I think the guy has a serious um, problem that he won't get help for because he's not going to admit it. His family knows it. They're trying to save their asses. It's funny that on Hitler's last day, he was telling everyone who would listen to him in the bunker that they were winning the war. They said, but someone shut this guy up, please, at long last, please shut him up. Yeah, when you're, when you're recruiting 14-year-old kids to go out and, and, and die for their country, they can't even spell the name of their country, never mind die for it. That's when you, you, you've hit a low there. At that point, you should torture yourself. Trump, Trump will never let go. He will never let go of his idea of coming back, never let go of the idea that he won the election. Never. And he knows it's bullshit, but it's the most beautiful kind. It's pure bullshit. And he he deals in that almost exclusively. The most extraordinary. Well, you tell a story so much, Michael, that you believe, yeah. right? Yes. You know, I mean, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm sure there's some kind of meant, meant you know, some kind of um, technical term, medical term for it, but you, I mean, we both have known people that have told stories that are such bullshit, but yet they've told it so many times. It gets better. It gets better, and they believe it. Well, I mean, welcome to a baseball manager's office. I mean, <laughs> a baseball, uh, you know, there's, a, there's what actually really happened, and then there's the 20-year rule. And in the 20-year rule, at the end of the 20 years, it will become more spectacular. It'll have more people involved. It'll have more flair to it than anything you've ever seen. And he threw from right field on the warning track with his back turned. He threw it over his shoulder. One hop to like home. This. It was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> we all saw it. We all saw it. There were, uh, I, I mean, as a matter of fact, I was standing on the field right behind second base. But well, you never played baseball. I'm telling you, I walked out. Uh, I, was there, I, I uh, thought yeah. I was going to get a beer, but I walked out the other way. And believe me, was I in the wrong place? But what luck to be standing behind second base when he made that throw. Right, because he caught the ball and he looked at me to second baseman, Bobby Thompson, and he said, should I tag him <laughs> or should I let him go? And I said, tag the son of a gun. And that's how the story ended. That's how, <laughs> that's how the Yanks won the World Series. By the way, we got we got the uh, the, the subway will take you to sh to the home of the New York Mets, and you can watch the Yankees come to town. I watched it last night on my telephone. What did you think? Um, I thought it was excellent that the uh, Yankees got ahead. Uh, Aaron Judge hit a home run to start things like off, he, and then there was like another RBI. And then um. And then uh, the Mets came right back in the bottom of the inning and scored four. And, you know, th this is a big deal. It's a big deal. This is a big deal between uh, y Yankee and Mets fans. If you looked at my Facebook page last night, I was, you know, uh, it was, and it's even more of a big deal this year because for the first time, I think since 2000, both of these teams are in first place in their divisions. And well and well deserved too, the way they're planned. And so I think that you have you know, and and it's uh it's a um it, it's a morality series, it's a moral victory, it's the Cougars and the Huskies. Yeah. It really is the easiest way for people in Seattle to relate to this is, you know, the, the Yankees are the Huskies and the Mets are the Cougars. And so it shall always be. And the um, so when you beat the Yankees, it not only gives you more um, feeling inside, more of a, uh, a, a wind in your sails, uh, but for the fans, you know, Met fans have had to live with Yankee fans for years. Telling them, oh, your team sucks, this, that, the other thing. We've always been the the, uh, the stepchild, you know. But when you go out and you beat them, you feel good. You feel damn good. 
and you can, you know, you stand up to your friends. Oh, I only won 27 World Series. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I, 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 it, it's always funny to me because <laughs> I, 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 I remember, you know, Met Yankee fans always say, well, we won our first in 1927, uh, we won 27 of them. And I always use, my answer always was, yeah, but you know what? The Yankees came into the league and uh, moved from Baltimore up to New York in 1901. They didn't win their worst f- first World Series until 1927. It took them 26 years to win a World Series. The Mets came into the league in 1962 and won their first World Series in 1969. It only took us seven years. What the hell is wrong with you guys? They're slow. The Bronx is noticeably slower. So when you ain't got nothing, you got to come up with something. If it's 3 o'clock at Shea Stadium, it's 2.45 in in the Bronx. I can't explain it, but they've been behind forever. It is. It's the way it it is. It is. Um. So, yeah, so that continues today, and that's, uh, uh, you know, it's a good ribbing because loyal Met fans uh, give it back, and especially that you won last night. And, you know, the Mets are winning with that, without that. Well, they got Scherzer back, but DeGrom is uh, coming along. And, he, I mean, once they get DeGrom and Scherzer uh, back fully, um, it's going to be an interesting ball game. But I mean, with, all the, with all these tight races going on, the trade deadline that's been t- touted each and every 30 minutes on ESPN.com hasn't really produced any interesting ideas, no no major changes. Well, you know, the, the, the Soto thing is, is you know, everybody wants Soto. Um, I'm not 100% convinced he's really going to go anywhere, to be honest with you, especially now that he said, well, listen, I'm going to... Uh, you know, you can trade for me, but when I, my two years are up that I have left, I'm going to uh, explore free agency. Find so if home. you want to keep me, whatever you give up for me, you're gonna, you're only gonna have me for two years, maybe. I mean, maybe I'll sign with your team. So that leaves a number of teams out uh, because a lot of teams with great prospects are saying, "Wait a second, my guy may be just as good as you." In two, two years. years down the road. And then I'm going to have to give up uh, and look at somebody come back and beat me. So you have that. Um, now, for a team like, I don't know, the Mariners, does it make sense? Well, the Mariners' goal has to be get to the playoffs. Yes. And whatever they have to do to get there, I mean, they were kind of in the same position they were in 95. And in 2000 and 2001, uh, you know, you got to make some moves. You got to do what you need to do to get what you need to get to the playoffs. Uh, you know, people don't understand that you you stock a farm system for players, but you also stock a farm system for players that you can trade. Yep. Now, how, who would you have left if you traded for Soto? Uh, I I don't notice that there's there's a ton. I mean, the Mariners have a pretty good farm system right now. Um, I don't know what it would take to get Soto, to be honest with you. And I don't know, you know, again, he he would be a two-year rental. And then you have to see if he will acclimate to Seattle because I'm convinced it takes a certain kind of player to come here. Yeah, 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 yeah. And play. And there are some players that come here and love it, and other players that come here and they fail miserably. I got to call Jay Buner. I must be doing something wrong. I hate it here. I'm miserable. Somebody help me. Yeah, I I, I think that's that has to be considered in the mix too. Um, you know, is he going to want to go to a place that has as many cold days a year as we have here? I mean, this is a guy from. I think he's, uh, I don't don't know where he's from, but I think he, I think he spent time in Florida, if I'm not mistaken, and is used to warmer weather. Yeah, Latin America, obviously. Yeah, well, I I, I don't know, I don't know that to be for sure, I mean, you know, we gotta, you know, and there's some players that it doesn't bother, didn't bother Edgar Martinez, No. right, didn't bother, uh, doesn't bother uh, Julio Rodriguez, doesn't seem to bo- nothing seems to bother him. Yeah, I mean, boom. 
You know, by the way, they beat the Texas again last night, Thank and you. all of a sudden, the, the, the bad taste of um, of the weekend's whooping by the Astros uh, is at least a little bit less. The um... you know, which, uh, again, yeah, you know. I don't know, Mikey. Uh, it's it's July. It's almost August. It's almost August. It's July. If you're going to lose a series to the Astros, this is probably the time to do it. Well, that's the Giants' attitude, Vinny, and it's gotten them 17 and a half games out of first place. 17 and a half. I repeat that. Now, if you woke up when you wake up in the morning and take a look at the standings, and you're in third place, still 17 and a half out. And your injuries can uh, include your first baseman, your shortstop, and your third baseman. What do you got? You got bandages. You got somebody in white pants in the clubhouse t- tending to everybody. Okay, you put on ice, you sit on the thing. Da, 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 da. I got a call out to the uh, ambulance. He's coming in. We're taking you in for going to take pictures. Oh, we are we are a mess. So I, su- I surrender. I may have, I may have to be may have to put aside the Giants for a while and pick another team just to follow. Maybe I should pick the Mariners. Sometimes it's not your year, you know. It's I mean, not- you know, you go out there and you try to win every day, but it just isn't your, you know, it isn't your uh, your year. As, as you know, as a Mariner fan and a Met fan uh, and a Giants fan, uh, you know, you know that all too well. You know, you know that feeling. I The way I feel right now, why have I felt this way before? When was that? What year was it? Oh, it was many years. Think back to Johnny LeMaster. Ah, yeah. Think back to Manny Trio. Uh, you, you know, I mean, go down the line of... Of, of years, failed experiments. Just, there was no hope. And then all of a sudden, guys like Will Clark came along and, uh, you know, and, 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 and pitching came along. And, you know, Dave Trevecki and um, Atlee Hamaker and, you know, I mean, down the the line there and all of a sudden it started to get good it's weird that we have so many people in the starting rotation and in the bullpen who claim to be pitchers but all over the league there are teams that have like 20 guys and Casey Stengel would look at them and say can anybody here play this game because it doesn't look like they can and many would answer no <laughs> not we we're, we're short on some of the details Casey but the general idea I think we get and many would answer you no. Know, by the way, uh, you were right. The Fed, uh, in our uh, in our developing news section here, I, hate to, I don't want to call it breaking news. The Fed has raised interest rates by 0.75 percent. Uh, another big jump as it continues uh, its campaign to rein in inflation, according to uh, the New York Times. Okay, the paper of record. So, the 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 housing market will probably tank even further because there's big big um, uh, problems right now and it's, it, nobody wants to buy a house interest rates are too high and the people who do want to buy a house can't get into the market can't even get the down payment down there so i think i think this is actually good if we can stall the market in housing right i think that's what they're trying to do is trying to cool it off a little bit Put the brakes on that one. Yeah, I mean, when you look at a house, uh, you look in, um, I don't know, uh, pick a city in, in Kansas, you know, Salina, Kansas, all right? When you look at a house in Salina, Kansas, and it's $490,000. Wait, and, 388. You know, the price just went down. Yeah, most most houses, in, uh, most jobs in Salina, Kansas pay $20, $25 an hour. That's math that doesn't work out for anybody. Nobody, nobody gets to play that game. So you have to, you have to try to do something. And I don't think, you know, I, I mean, the need is more immediate, I think, in in other areas. But if you slow down housing, maybe you slow down a few other things, and uh, give some people a chance to to just cool things off. I, I don't know. Um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm certainly not an economist. Uh, I'm horrible with money. So as we as we all know. So we'll see what happens. But it's it's definitely um, 
I guess it, to, I guess today the thing I'm going to watch mostly is the Department of Justice. I, I want to see some announcements. I want to see some developments. I want to I want to feel comfortable <clears throat> that the greatest <clears throat> the greatest pack of criminals that this country has ever created has to face justice and soon because they, right now the, their plans, Vinny, are to go back into power and change this country first and foremost to the place where it cannot be changed back. Yeah, this there's, there's, there's a clear, as that uh, judge so eloquently but slowly put it uh, in the hearings uh, many days ago, uh, there is a clear and present danger to our democracy, and it's Donald Trump. When guys talk slowly like that, I get involved. I want to see, are they really thinking about the next word or are they just playing with me? He not only thought about the next word, he made sure it was pronounced right. Oh, yeah. Spelled right. Knew the exact three meanings of the word the city dictionary slang of the word and uh, <laughs> i like the fact a picture of what that word was right in his mind when you appear before the select committee you got to turn on your own mic and move your little microphone and that was the best part about his thing turn it on move it mm. think think about that first word thank you for that question uh, listen, I admire somebody who thinks like that. I mean, it doesn't make great TV or radio, but uh, I, without a doubt, admire people who actually think about what they're saying and don't just say it off the top of their uh, their noggins because it sounds good as a uh, as a, a ten second soundbite. This guy's spaces between his words were ten seconds. If you look for a ten second soundbite out of this guy, you weren't going to get it. I know you want to talk about Rudy Giuliani and Mark Meadows, but I just want to say I'm having a wonderful time watching Shark Week, okay? And I'm here before the committee because the new episode doesn't come on until six local time. So ask away. I'm here. I'm 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 all, I'm all yours. But my answers are a little slower than usual because you know up here Shark Week. Do you watch Shark Week? Are you a, a Shark well, Week person? Chris, I've never. Kristen loves to dive, so. Um, she likes all the equipment and the divers and th their uh, nomenclature and what they do underwater and how they put put themselves in completely ridiculous situations and somehow live through it. I um, yeah, I've just never. I mean, it's not that I don't like. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I like sharks. I like. Uh, well, I don't like sharks. I mean, I think they're dangerous animals. I respect sharks. Yeah. That would probably be the way. Hey. The they way have to certainly go. earned. If, if if a shark hasn't earned your respect, then you haven't watched Shark Week. Yeah, yeah, I, I, you know, but I've known that uh, since Jaws. I didn't Shark Week to tell me that. Uh, you know, Jaws probably set me on that trail. <laughs> Never have so many been scared by so few. I remember when Jaws came out, I was in my parents' swimming pool looking behind me every five seconds. I knew there was a shark in there somewhere. The, the feeling that that's behind you and you can't see it and your little feet are dangling in the water, that's not a good feeling. Oh, man. Um, and I want free stamps if I get attacked. Free SNH stamps for every shark attack on the, uh, on the Cape Cod coast. By the way, Mikey, uh, yeah, yeah, SNH green stamps for the... <laughs> Uh, one thing that we, uh, that I wanted to, um, well, a couple of things that I wanted to talk about, I'll make sure we got in, uh, this morning. I did a, uh, Seahawks round table last night with a bunch of guys and it was kind of fun. You know, Seahawks camp opens up today, is it? Now it should be open. Yeah, I think it's open. I think today, I think everybody's probably in or pretty close to being in and, um, you know, talking about what this year is going to be for the Seahawks. And what's the consensus? Playoff? Who really knows. No, but no, uh, you know, listen, we did a thing last night where we went down the list of games, and I was reluctant to even do this because, you know, when you have a team that you don't know who the quarterback is going to be, it's kind of hard to say whether they're going to beat somebody or whether they're not going to beat somebody. When you don't know what you have in young draft picks, uh, it's hard to say, but I went through the, the list and, and I came up with 10 and 7. Um, I think that is an overly optimistic 
look, and I'm sure it won't be the same uh, when we should be asked this question at the break of spring uh, of training. Well, the the twelve man thing is based on being overly optimistic. You're always in a pretty good mood. You're loud. You think you're going to win, and you're going to be able through through sheer willpower prevent the other team from taking part in the game. Well, even hearing their signals. This is something new for Seahawk fans, and, and I realized it when I was on this thing last night because I was on with uh, one guy that was 21 years old or something like that, but very good uh, sports, very knowledgeable sports guy. I think he's probably going to be somebody in the in the in the sports business because he had a kid out of Wazoo, nice kid, and uh, the other the other kids i mean it was me and mark and norb and then the, uh, the other two guys on it were young guys and so for the first time in their lives they're kind of experiencing a seahawks team that is not expected to do much of anything you know i mean let's face it there aren't you know while the seahawks are always in the con- we're always in the conversation for the super bowl for the playoffs most people got them pegged to five wins this year. Well, what did your group last night come up with? Who's going to be the quarterback? That's the question I would like answered. How are you um, going to pick 10 if you don't know who's calling the signals? Nobody knows. That, that uh-huh. thing. I mean, I think, uh, um, you know, I, I, I think Locke is probably, if, I were, if you asked me to put $5 down on this, I would say Locke is going to be, uh, is going to be the guy. He's going to be given every opportunity to be the guy. Uh, I think there was things that they saw that they didn't like in Geno Smith last year, as we both know, and and um, I think, listen, they traded Russell Wilson in part for Drew Locke. Yes. So he better be good. He wasn't a throw-in on the deal, according to the Seahawks. He was somebody that they wanted well he's oh. got he's he's just short of experience that's all i'm not going to say a, a, a bad word about the young man but ex, except for that he, right. hasn't seen, he hasn't seen enough rams coming at him in the middle of the night let's see what we got let's see you know let's let's see what it is um i think most seahawks fans expected the seahawks to go out and get baker mayfield you know or mm-hmm. or or you know some are thinking that jimmy garoppolo will be up here before uh it, maybe even before the, the uh, beginning of the season. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know that you're going to pay him that much money or how much it's going to take to get him up here or make a trade or give away some of your draft picks. And remember, Jimmy's coming off an injury. Garoppolo right, is- right. And and that's the other thing. When is he not injured? I mean, when he plays, he plays well, but I don't know. I've been following him now for, what is it, seven, eight years? And has he played a full season in those seven or eight years? And also, in his defense, I would say, watch what happens to Jimmy when he has to roll out of the pocket. He's not the fastest guy. He has trouble when he's being pursued in terms of making decisions that are good for the team. He likes to throw to the other team at certain points in the third quarter when, when he's being chased. And he got knocked around a lot. All those injuries didn't come because he uh, took testosterone and bumped his head in the shower. He he got he got hurt playing football the way quarterbacks do when the the, the line is competitive but can't protect. Well, I, you know, Mikey, I, I think that one of the things that we're going to see is is uh, for the Seahawks is probably a redesigned offense. Uh, you know, probably something that's going to take. You know, the Seahawks. We brought I brought this up last night with the guys. Uh, we haven't seen the Seahawks use the tight ends in the Russell Wilson era um, because they knew that they had a guy who could rear back and, you know, make the, make the bomb play and make it work. Or they, had a, they knew they had a guy who could run out to the, you know, run out the flat and, and take off and get them 25, 30, 40, maybe touchdown, you know, get them the yards they needed. I think that's always an example of teams that can't score in the red zone. If you don't have tight ends, that that immediately subtracts your chances for scoring in the red zone. And I think they do have tight ends on this team. And I think it's it, you know if if I'm reading it right, and I'm not you know I mean I'm I'm 
I'm not a football expert. You got to get a U Millen for that kind of thing, or you know, or, or Dave Wyman, or one of those guys. What I what I think though is that they're going to go back and reinstitute some of the West Coast offense where you use the tight ends, you make short, sharp passes, move the ball up the field, ten and ten and ten and ten. It may not be as exciting football as Seahawks fans are used to. Uh, but I think it's a way that you can take a quarterback of good ability and turn him into a quarterback of great ability. Now, here's another question for your panel from last night. Who's your running back? Because if you're doing play action pass for the short pass, you got to have a running back to fake to. He's got to be there. And right now that's a, that's a question mark. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you had, you you know, you had, uh, what was it? Uh, um, one of the running backs yesterday uh, is not coming back from an injury. I mean, I think you have, uh, you know, I, I think you have a couple of, of solid guys on the team, but uh, again, that's what you, you know, that's what, and I think that's what Pete Carroll, that's what kind of tipped me off to this a little bit. I think that's what Pete Carroll wants to do. I think, you know, the Seahawks weren't a great run the ball team and they need to become one. Yes. You know, um, Again, you lost a special quarterback. So now it's, you know, you lost a quarterback who could make things happen with his feet and with his arm. And you're not going to have that anymore. So how do you adjust to that? You know, how do you take, uh, you know, your your team and, and turn it into a a defensive you know a, a team that's more oriented on maybe defense stopping the other team and scoring maybe enough points to beat the other team not you know no no, no great shakes just win well usually teams that have that as their moniker play 500 ball yeah well you got to figure out a way to do that better in a tough 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 division, man. Not gonna, yeah. I don't, I don't see that happening. But another thing that it can happen to a team like that, and I've seen it happen to the 49ers, is you win two games in the year, and you have no idea which two it's going to be. When no matter what you do, you're in every game, but you can't win. You're, you're within striking distance, but you don't strike. You have the time, but the time got away from you. Well, that's what happened last year, I think, with the Seahawks. For the, but now again, Russell Wilson was injured, but I don't, I don't know that they were blown out. Right, of of many games, and and I think that that's what Pete Carroll has to fix. It is is he up to that job? You know, or was it you know, was it time to uh, to to send him a packing? One of the things Carroll did so effectively, and it was a revolution at the time when he first came to USC, was he said, in the past, if you were a senior, you got to play, and the freshman got to sit. That's not a rule anymore. If the freshman's capable. He's going to not only play, but he's going to start. And I'm going to turn this team around in a big hurry because if you've got the talent, we're going to put you on the field. And I think he can use that theory to to reinvigorate the Seahawks, given an opportunity. Everybody gets a shot at this at this point. You're on my roster. You have a chance to play. Show me you can play, and the tackle job is yours. The running back job is yours. The receiver's job is yours. Show yeah. me you can play, and and you, and you and you'll be playing here. Yeah, I think that's, uh, yeah, I think that is uh, very, very good and astute observation with, uh, with Pete. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see how it, uh, how it works out. People will be going out to camp. It, it, it's, uh, I don't, I'm a little bit more optimistic than average on the Seahawks, but I also think that fans are going to have to, Real in expect you know lowered expectations this year. Take a dose of reality. It's a yeah, painful. Take a dose it's a painful of reality. Thing. Realize that if this team wins this year, it'll be um, it'll be an achievement. It'll hey, be. By something. the way, Denny, all we're going through is a market adjustment. It's right. Different. It's just you know you add five thousand dollars onto the ticket prices, and you'll be okay. Uh, you and one other thing too, I wanted to mention. Well, two other things. One other thing was. Uh, my buddy uh, that I used to work with over KJR, I think he came after you left. Scott Soden, hot shot Scott, is uh, coaching a, a, a little league softball team. 
women, you know, what girls softball, and they are in the uh, Western Regional. It looks like. Where are they playing? Uh, they're playing. Um, it's Hermiston, Oregon versus Issaquah. I don't know exactly where they are playing. Is it the uh, Issaquah Spiders? Come on, Spiders. Yeah, it's the Northwest Region. Um. Uh, Wherever they're playing has a Ferris wheel and a beach. Oh, I think it's Chicago, actually, or outside of Chicago. Oh, that's Union Park, then. So they, they beat, uh, let's see, they, they beat, uh, well, they beat another team. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way it goes. That's a market adjustment. Which is always good to do. <laughs> oh, they beat Montana 5-1 to one. <laughs> Well, then good hey, luck to us. When you Scott. want sports, when you want <laughs> intense sports analysis, you come right here to Mikey and Vinny. You get it. They beat another team. <laughs> Fine. The, the score is not important, but five to one is as close as we can come. The, the score is not important. The team is not important. It's just that they are uh, they are, are advancing. They are uh, they're moving. And uh, Scott's a good guy. He... Um, you know, I know him a long time, and I'm excited that uh, he's leading this uh, group of young women to uh, what looks like uh, it should be a, a pretty pretty good um, game, and hopefully they'll kick, kick the crap out of Hermiston, Oregon. I think that's over in Eastern Oregon, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but they are uh, they're wearing the proud colors of Issaquah. They'll be on 4 o'clock this afternoon. And, wow. Uh, if you are around here, please uh, tune in. If you are, you want to hang out with a bunch of people, and this is what I probably should do this afternoon, is go to uh, Stan's Barbecue out in Issaquah and watch the game. Is Hot Shot Scott going to be mic'd up in the dugout? I hope not. <laughs> I know Hot Shot, and, and, and he's a guy that probably shouldn't be mic'd up. Nope. Say something you regret. Okay, bad idea. It's probably a good idea. Uh, you know, because somebody's gonna, somebody's gonna get hurt. <laughs> There's gonna you know, be blood. Somebody's gonna get in trouble. Somebody's gonna get their feelings hurt. And, and you know, these things work. You don't want somebody to get their feelings hurt, Mikey. No. Nope. You want, uh, you know, because then you're gonna have parents calling you up in the middle of the night saying, "What did you do to my daughter? She can't sleep now because of you were yelling at her in front of na on national TV." I mean, it just, uh, it's just, it doesn't pay, Michael. There's no Just upside. Leave the no. microphone. Leave that to the Mike. Go Mike Buck Showalter up. You know, go Mike uh, somebody else up. Go go Mike the umpire up. Go Mike uh, the hot dog guy out there. Up. Go go you know? go Mike up Lou Pinella and his lazy boy. Bob. Don't do that either. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to see. You don't want to know. Do you? You know. I mean, sometimes it's like watching sausage being made. Okay. It you don't want to know. And one other thing quickly, our, our good friend, uh, Eliza Thomas, you know, you know, Eliza. Sure. Elise. I don't know why I said Eliza. Elise. Uh, she's got her Seattle studs uh, uh, playing in the uh, NBC World Series. Wow. Go studs. Yeah. So she's in Wichita, Kansas. I better get a studs t-shirt. She sent me a note. So go studs. You know, I mean... Listen, it's great to talk about the Mariners and the Seahawks and the Sonics and the and and the Kraken and everything else, but uh, you know, a lot of people love these teams. They're, your neighbors are on them. Your friends, your kids, uh, you know, um, people take the time to volunteer to coach these teams and to teach these people how to play sports and do it in a in a in a very good manner. So, give them a little props as well. Because they go through market adjustments too, just like the rest of us. So they still got to get a hit. But their market, I mean, I would suspect that the Issaquah market adjustment is only 2000 as opposed to <laughs> a Seattle market adjustment, which would be a five grand at the very least. Or a Bruce Springsteen market adjustment, which would be, uh, you know, $9,000 for a, a ticket up in the rafters. That's the Asbury adjustment. I'm not ready for that. Oh, man, I was so, you know, I was just so disappointed this morning, Michael.
Are you going to try some more on, for our Freaky Friday show? Will you have tickets? Uh, no, I don't think. I mean, I'm I, I'm at the point now where I'm going to have to to start calling people I know and seeing if somebody's got an extra ticket or how you know how in the world can I can I get into the show if I even can. But if I don't, Michael, what are you going to do, man? You know, I just stay off Facebook for a couple of days because I won't want to see everybody's pictures in there saying how they got in. Um, I, I just, I can't afford to pay that much for a ticket. No. You know, I'm, I'm a, uh, what, what was, uh, what, what, what was uh, Hyman Roth's great line? I'm a, I'm a retired uh, businessman. Living on, on a pension. Living on a fixed income. Living on a fixed income. I, uh, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, re, I'm a retired pensioner living on a fixed income. Yeah, I'm a retired pensioner living on a fixed income. <laughs> and then I heard a bang. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> <laughs> all why of a sudden, that, my Medicare kicked in. <laughs> why is that so funny? I don't know. It's American humor. When all of a sudden, when all of a sudden, you want to get together? Right, Mikey, I was, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I say, well, shall we get together for a Freaky Friday? Why don't we do that? Uh, we'll have some. We'll have some fun. I'll be uh, less Bruce Springsteen disappointed. Maybe uh, not. Maybe 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 you'll be more disappointed. I, you know, I don't know, Mikey. I, I, I'm I'm disappointed. I'm uh, delusioned more or disillusioned, I should say, uh, more just about the whole idea of Springsteen. And the way this has just shut out so many of the people that got him to where he is. I'm surprised that we haven't heard a sensible comment from him about this problem. Well, we haven't heard anything from him, but his uh, his manager, let's see if I can find it here real quick. His, uh, his mania, uh, let's see, said, uh, okay, John Landau from the New York Times. After days of this sort of commentary, Mr. Springsteen and his camp had heard enough. In pricing tickets for this tour, quote, in pricing tickets for this tour, we look carefully at what our peers have been doing. His manager, John Landau, said in a statement, we chose prices that are lower than some and on par with others. Quoting again, regardless of the commentary about a modest number of tickets costing a thousand dollars or more, not a modest number, John, every damn ticket on the queue was over a thousand dollars. And when I found ones that were under and I moved it over to buy them, by the time I purchased them, they were they were uh, over a thousand dollars a piece. And that's what pisses me off more than anything else. If they if you just put it up there, it's a thousand dollars. OK, I can't afford it. That's you know, I don't know. I'll go watch uh, Access TV. But the fact that you're sitting there and the thing says 230 something dollars and you go and you move it into the box and when you go to check out, it's $5,000 for two tickets. That's just a market adjustment. Yeah, it's a hell of a market adjustment. Uh, I believe that in today's environment, that is a fair price to see some one universally regarded as among the very greatest artists of his generation. Well, one thing doesn't equal the other. We no one, no one said he wasn't a great artist and, and someone to be respected and loved by Americans uh, coast to coast. What they said was, "You're charging too much for your tickets, and you're pretending you're not." Right. We're in a we're in a recession. It's a slimy way to do it. It's uh, it's it's it has all the signs of trickery and skullduggery. Uh, and, Good job. And one of my favorite people. Skullduggery. Trickery. Yeah, and, and uh, subterfuge on top of it. Subterfuge always was the slowest of the three. Yeah, but yeah. still a great player. Great skullduggery get right up there, um, and it, it just it leaves a bad taste in everybody's <laughs> wallet. It's it's like cold zeppola on the Jersey Shore. You know, you know. Well, nobody you wants know, that. Nobody wants buy, that. Maybe. You buy the zeppola seven eight o'clock at night. And you're walking around with the bag, and it's getting greasier as the night goes on, and the powdered sugar has coagulated on top of the oil, and it's about I don't know now. You, now you got the thing on the seat of your car, and you drop your girl off, and you're going, 
you're driving the way you're driving. You say, I got to, oh, man, I'm all so hungry. And at this time, there's nothing open. These were the days when there was nothing open. And nothing open on East Street? Bag. Wouldn't there be something open on East Street? No? No. no. You open up. Maybe, maybe if you drive to Route 9, there's an all-night diner open. Maybe if you drive. Yeah, I'm sure if you drive to Route 9. Matter of fact, the last time, well, yeah, my friend George and I, we took a ride. And we wound up at a diner at two thirty or three o'clock in the morning. The last uh, the one I went to, when I went to, uh, Joe Grishecki was playing at a bar in um, Asbury Park, and we were convinced. As a matter of fact, I think Joe was convinced too because I talked to him that Bruce was going to show up at this bar and play, and he didn't. And so it was okay. You know, seeing Joe is good. We're happy with that. But we had we were staying in Asbury Park, and we had that, okay, it's, you know, 2 o'clock in the morning kind of thing. And the only thing that was open is you had to drive to Route 9 and go to a diner. And the diner was exactly what you would expect it to be. An all-night diner. Uh, you know, uh, um, people of all sorts of... Um, Persuasions. Genres. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> eating ham and eggs <laughs> and waffles and pancakes and you know and, uh, but anyway getting back to my original thing here the zeppelin zeppelin they get hard and they get crunchy and the, and the, the powdered sugar on top coagulates and joins with the oil and it's it's one of probably the worst things that you could possibly eat it's like month old bread without the mold but you eat it anyway. But you bite into it because the sugar tastes so good. And uh, and the dough still has that softness inside. It's not hot anymore. It's not it's it's not that zippola that you that they sold you uh six for two dollars or whatever it was. But you bite into it and you get the powdered sugar all over you and you you take a bite and you go, Man, this is living. You're not gonna get sticky fingers on the steering wheel, are you? Yep. Oh dear. Yeah, I mean, oh the white sugar by now is all over your shirt, but you drop your girlfriend off. You don't care. And You're you brush good. it off, but you know, confectioner's sugar, when you brush it off, it doesn't do anything but streak. Yeah, it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah, you, you, you got to take your shirt off. I mean, especially when you're in a black shirt, forget about it. That was a word Jerry Wexler used to describe a lot of popular music it's made by confectioners. I go, whoa, not musicians, not producers, not professionals, confectioners. That's a way to talk about it. I love a that. Little, a, yeah. a little musical candy for you. Yeah, yeah. I think I actually use that phrase while introducing songs at times. I think I might have said something like, uh, you know, because I never like a lot of DJs used to say, here's something tasty for you. And I didn't like that. No. But I liked, here's some ear candy. <laughs> Well, here's something sweet <laughs> wow. from Metallica. <laughs> it will be a fractious, free-loading, fun-filled Friday. And it's not it's just a couple days away, as near as I can tell. The way we're going, we should just sit here and wait for it to click over. Uh, all it'll right, be Mikey. It'll be a tumescent Thursday. Yes, Mikey, thank you for, uh, for unlo helping me unload. Uh, we, unpacked, we unpacked everything, and it's in your storage unit ready to go. I appreciate that, my brother. I will uh, see you on Friday if the Lord's willing and the creek don't rise. You have a good one, Mikey. You too, Vinny. All Adios. right, peace, love, Matashevitz. What a wine.